He's here. He's in white face, and he has a luger around just for you. It's time for more Hair Schnitzel Nazi. We last left off our story when our heroes captured a teenage girl Cthulhu cultist and learned more about this mysterious god in the lake. And it was one of the few notable events where one of us didn't die. Unfortunately, some 200 children, counselors, and workers at the camp did die though. But the Herr Schnitzel Nazi, their deaths were necessary sacrifices to continue his crusade. At this point, we would spend most of our time trying to devise a ways to kill a god's spirit. Unfortunately, we had a lot of difficulty thinking of any. I believe that it was Jason Knight, the ghost hunter, who came up with the idea. It was essentially, God in the lake, God no leave lake. God need lake to live. We make lake no more. We make God no more. That presented us with another problem though. How can you kill a fucking lake? Even with all of the firepower Herr Schnitzel Nazi once had, it wasn't enough to actually destroy a lake, let alone a god that lives within it. At this point, the commune cult had become rather desperate to stop us, and had also been expanding their numbers drastically, recruiting from all over the country in an effort to accelerate the resurrection of their god. This presented more problems than the obvious, as cultist attacks have become a fairly normal thing, as well as attacks by what we called Big Brothers. Those are the things that came out of the lake in the first session. Seeing how brethren turn into them eventually, and due to their massive size, we figured that the name was appropriate. Things weren't getting easy at this point, but our activity had another unexpected effect on the state around us. Seeing how we completely obliterated a fairly large town at one point, and how we've continued to wage battles in other populated areas in other sessions, and also how an entire summer camp was completely massacred by unknown creatures, Montana had gone into a sort of state of emergency. That's even one way that the cult was gaining members. They proclaimed to be a safe haven for people to seek refuge at. We tried to curb the reputation with rumors that they're responsible for the destroyed towns, monsters, and magic, but they were just way better at it than we were. We had done a better job at securing a base around the old camp though, had plenty of food, water, electricity, and had set up monitoring stations and listened and watched TV constantly to pick up on the news. Sergeant Jackson would constantly listen in to military frequencies to learn about their movements. Wolf stags would scout around the area, trying to learn of the cult's doings and watch their progress. Josephi made us some pretty fucking good smoothies. Tiffany would also spend an obscene amount of time on Tinder trying to get rebound sex to make up for the pain of her murdered boyfriend and parents. Still completely unaware that I was partially responsible, and Jason Knight used his TV show to try and promote conspiracy theories about the commune. We were despairing at this point. We couldn't figure out what to do, and at this point we almost thought that the cult could win. But then, Sergeant Jackson heard over one of the military frequencies that all of the freaky stuff that's been going on in the state, the military is planning on relocating some of the nuclear weapons to more safe locations. That's when we got the idea on how we were going to obliterate the lake. When I told the others about this, they were for some reason apprehensive about the idea of setting off a thermonuclear device. They also pointed out that if we do steal it, then the entire might of the United States military was going to be on our asses in seconds. We'd probably end up getting our own satellite. I convinced them by saying that it was our only chance for revenge, because at this point, our only option were to run away and do nothing while the god in the lake rises to kill us all, or sit on our asses here and have them kill us before the god in the lake rises. Not long after, the others were in business, and we had our plan all ready. The nuclear weapon was being transported down a fairly major river in order to make it to a railway, and was under exceptionally heavy guard. We could never catch up to it near a railroad, so we figured our only chance was to get it at the river. We also didn't need the entire missile. 
We only needed the warhead, which would be rather difficult to get, but it would be much easier than moving an entire missile. Pooling our funds together, we managed to buy an extremely high quality speedboat, which we rode out into the scheduled river three days before the move was scheduled to happen. We stayed on the boat and hid it in the brush near the riverbank, just deep enough for us to start up quickly. When the boat arrived, we finally understood the definition of what the US military meant when it said under heavy guard. There were several Apache attack helicopters flying overhead. Tanks and Humvees patrol along the road next to the river, and at least six patrol boats armed with miniguns and missile launchers escorted the large vessel used to transport the missile itself, and we counted dozens of guards on board the ship itself. All this, and whoever knows what other deterrents our GM might have come up with. Things were not exactly looking up for us at this point. We decided that going all pirate on the boat was not exactly an option for us at this point. That's when we decided to go with plan B. We decided to abandon our super expensive speedboat in favor of something else. The boat was moving at night, which made this far easier than it could have been. We all got out one of those scuba jets, which would allow us to get up to the boat in time. Wolf and Sergeant Jackson went for one of the patrol boats and killed the crew on board. Meanwhile, Tiffany, Jason, Josephi, and I all scaled up the side of the boat and started sneaking our way through. Josephi had a lot of experience with engines and went out to disable their engine, hoping to move attention away from the cargo. This worked as the guy rolled a critical in his attempt, making it look perfectly like an accident. While the crew was busy with this, I led the others to the direction of the missile. Josephi was invaluable here and did a perfect job of getting out the warhead without spilling a shit ton of radiation to kill us. Tiffany's phone, however, went off during one of her stealth rolls, which alerted the guards to our whereabouts. I shot and killed the guards, but apparently gunshots are extremely loud. More guards arrived and we got into a massive shootout. Military personnel are also far better at fighting than cultists are and we found ourselves getting overwhelmed. Having prepared for this, I attached a 15 pound block of C4 to the wall behind us, and we all took cover. After throwing a smoke bomb and three stick grenades into the room, covering our escape and killing a few marines in the process, the four of us ran out of the hole I had made. Josephi, Tiffany, and Jason were all pretty badly injured during the fight, but I had somehow managed to evade getting hit. I personally apply that to Herr Schnitzel Nazi's uncommonly high dexterity score. We ran along the edges of the ship. I pulled a Henderson and Judo kicked a guard who tried to take us prisoner off the ship. Thank you again, dexterity. The others jumped off the ship, but before I could, I found nearly all of the ship's guards right behind me. I raised my two middle fingers and said, Sig hail, motherfuckers, and then slipped over the edge, losing only three hit points in the process. The other patrol boats and helicopters were searching furiously for us in the water, but we stealthily made our way over to the patrol boat which Jackson and Wolf had procured. Getting ready to distract the military, we detonated some charges that we had placed on our fancy speedboat, which immediately ugh, drew the attention of every helicopter and boat in the river, which allowed us to escape with our nuclear warhead completely unmolested. The military also didn't go looking for the boat because they just assumed that it went out to secure the river. In actuality, we learned via Google Maps that the river we were in was connected to the lake. Damned convenient. Tiffany watched the news on her phone and they reported that our nuclear warhead was stolen. But the terrorists who stole it were almost likely killed when their boat caught fire and exploded. We doubted the military really believed that, but we're just trying to get people not to panic. We made our way back to the lake not long later. It was a good time, but we had to figure out a way to detonate a warhead, but that could be done later. Maybe we could kidnap a nuclear scientist or something. That's when the cultists showed up. Oh yeah, you thought the incident with the boats was all over, didn't you? The cult had heard about what happened, and immediately suspected us, and prepared an ambush. A dozen speedboats that the cult apparently owned came out of nowhere, 
There are guys armed with their assault rifles, some heavy machine guns, and even a few rocket launchers. To make matters worse, we also noticed some of the brethren swimming around in the water, attempting to climb on board our ship, as well as other Eldritch horrors beneath the waves. The cultists got the drop on us and damaged the ship. Unfortunately for them, it was equipped with mini guns and missile launchers, which helped us damage their numbers. But even when we hit back with those, the cult hit back again. They used some of their magic to curse our ship, making things break and jam, and other unfortunate things happen to us. Wolf was hit with a lucky shot by one of the cultists and went down to die. Even me, with all of my medical knowledge, couldn't save him. Things were hard, but after all of us being pretty badly injured, we managed to wipe out the last of the cultists. That's when I decided to give the cult another fuck you moment. I dropped off the others at the shore by the camp. That's when I wired every missile in round on board the boat to go up. Then I started the boat up and jammed it into maximum acceleration on direct course for the commune. Herr Schnitzel Nazi jumped off the boat not long after starting it and swam to shore. We then watched as the boat, moving at surprisingly fast speed, ram ashore by the commune and immediately blow up, giving us an explosion that we could see clearly all the way across the massive lake. Adventures of Herr Schnitzel Nazi Killing the Gods. So here were everyone, the end game. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but today's sponsor is brought to you by Neckbeardia's 3D printed models. Go ahead and check out the eBay store down below. We have tons and tons of really cool looking models. We've got it all from orcs, dwarves, the lizards and fish people. And yes, most of the sets you can get some big bitty bitches in with them. <laughs> and honestly, they're our biggest sellers. Yeah, by far. Yeah. All the models are printed and processed by us, and it is by far the best way to help us out to do what we do. So go ahead and check them out below, and just just look at this lizard lady with titties. She got big titties. <laughs> look at the titties! <laughs> These were the final days of Herr Schnitzel Nazi, and I knew it. I think that the GM just wanted Herr Schnitzel Nazi to die, just in order to prove that he could actually do it. He thought that this character's strength came from his obscenely large arsenal of weapons, so he took my car, and that backfired on him. He tried to do everything in his power to kill my character, and that backfired on my entire party. But in this session, I knew that the GM wouldn't let Herr Schnitzel Nazi live. Don't get me wrong, I completely understand. Like I said, I DM slash GM myself. So I knew of his struggles. I even honestly wanted Herr Schnitzel Nazi to die, I think. But I knew that if he was going to go, it would be in the best way imaginable. And I'd be damned if that fucking god in the lake made it out of this too. The few sessions in between the incident with the boats and killing the gods were spent trying to figure out how to detonate the warhead in order to destroy the lake. In that time, we kidnapped a nuclear scientist, adding to our other prisoner, the female cultist of Cthulhu, who we learned at that point was named Jade. Actually, an interesting development happened there. The girl who played Tiffany the Teenage Girl IRL discovered that she was bisexual in those few sessions. I think Gal Gadot had something to do with her sexual awakening. Becoming excited by this, she decided to roleplay that Tiffany, still in grief over the loss of her boyfriend and family, discovered this, and decided to take comfort in the arms of the beautiful Jade. Herr Schnitzel Nazi deeply approved of this relationship, as I knew out of game that Nazis actually did a lot to advance women's rights, and despite being arduously opposed to male homosexuality, they were surprisingly lenient when it came to lesbianism. Because it's hot. That's why. <laughs> but besides, Herr Schnitzel Nazi would be damned if he didn't have the girl's best interest in mind. Going back to those few sessions, the commune and the god in the lake knew exactly what we were doing and started to throw every single thing they had at us. 
This got so bad that it actually forced us to move bases and even killed Josephy the smoothie maker in the process. We gave him a small funeral, something he'd enjoy. Pour out a smoothie for our homie Josephy, boys. <laughs> Pour out a smoothie. The president's girlfriend, who if you're forgetting was Josephy's player, decided that she wanted to get back to her roots. So she made a new character, Buck the Bruck who was the twin brother of her first character, Chuck the Chunk. He was basically the same character, but with a different name. She also decided to take advantage of the backstory-reliant nature of Call of Cthulhu, and said that Buck was one of an undisclosed numbers of siblings of Chuck, allowing her to justify bringing the same character back every time that one would die. There was also the next character for Wolf Staggs, Survival Master. Wolf's next character was a heavily armed spec ops operative named Victor Armstrong, who was trying to remain low for a while. Got bored, and then decided to just stick around with our group. We didn't complain. The hilarious thing about this character was how his player roleplayed him with so few fucks to give. I don't know how a human could not care about anything as much as Victor was roleplayed to. It was quite hilarious. The story begins with us in our new base on top of a small mountain, overlooking thousands of acres of forest as well as the lake which held our great Eldritch foe. Jason Knight, Ghost Hunter, was editing his footage that he had taken during our last session in an attempt to document our story and also get famous. Buck the Bruck was cleaning his shotgun and keeping watch for any of the bad people, yes? I believe was how he put it. Victor was setting up a perimeter and getting high on some of the weed that Herr Schnitzel Nazi had stolen off Buddy, the camp counselor. Sergeant Jackson was still keeping watch while also cleaning weapons and readying some homemade explosives. Meanwhile, Tiffany was off somewhere having sex with Jade. Lesbians. Every great story has to have lesbians, am I right? I know Tiffany and her player are bi. Yes, we know they're bi. Thank you. While they were doing this, I was guarding the nuclear scientist that we kidnapped and was making sure that he was working. I wasn't being a dick about it, barely even took it seriously. I smoked a bit of weed from a joint the size of a baby's arm and even offered him a hit or two. He took it and definitely mellowed out a bit. The first exciting incident was when our nuclear warhead was finally ready to be detonated remotely. Well, when I say ready, I meant that our warhead was so scantily designed that the GM only gave it a 50% chance of actually working. Our scientist was working with very limited material after all, and so we had to just throw together something that could potentially work for us. We didn't really mind though, it seemed to fit the motif of our party. We decided to celebrate this by having a bit of a feast. Soon it would all be over, our characters knew, and we finally have our revenge for what those bastards did to each and every one of us. Mostly me and the destruction of my precious car though. Pinto cruising wagons don't grow on trees, you know, and neither do Nazi weapons, Nazi gold, and the actual copy of the Mona Lisa. That night, in the midst of our feast, the GM described us seeing the lake with the god in it suddenly glowing a foul green color, so bright that it reaches clear to the sky. Not long after all of us started staring at the lake, we all collapsed in immense pain. A ghostly voice started whispering in our ears, a voice so horrible and great that began to tear at the very fabric of our minds. And yet, no matter how much it tore at us, or how much pain we were in, we could not help but listen and understand it. The voice said something different to each of us, each having to do with something personal and intimate to us. It started mocking, taunting, and intimidating us. And I knew it was Voldemort in the flesh. You're, you're a wizard, Schnitzel. Succeeding on my sanity check, I began to resist the will of the god in my mind. I instead picked myself off the ground. I was still in immense pain and I could still hear the voice perfectly well, but I was now able to actually somewhat think and perform actions unlike the others. I then looked right at the lake, still hearing the horrible voice of the god in my head. 
Then Herr Schnitzel Nazi zipped down his pants and underwear and began to vigorously masturbate while proceeding to proudly bell while proceeding to proudly bellow the German national anthem, which I'd actually memorized out of character. Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber alles, I shouted with great pride. No Eldrick god could ever get in between Herr Schnitzel Nazi and his sacred duty to the Third Reich, as well as the rise of the Fourth. Uber alles in der Welt. Wenn ist es zu schutz und truitze. Eventually, with my inspiring words, the pain in the voice began to recede, as did the color within the lake as well. The others lost a bit of sanity, but were for the most part fine. This attack on our minds only solidified our resolve to rid the world of this fucking god. That bitch was going to suffer. We all knew it. After that incident, and also after finishing masturbating, just everyone's like, like, got their backs turned, polite here, and it's like, just <laughs> slap of flesh as he's fucking trying to finish. Ah, uh, fuck me. Herr Schnitzel Nazi asked Tiffany if he could talk to Jade the cultist for a little while. We went off together, and I asked her what she knew of the essence of the gods, like the one that was in the lake. It was pretty easy to convince her to tell me as she at this point thought that I was only going after that god who was an enemy of Cthulhu. Jade was a relatively high-ranking sister of the cult, but after she told me that as far as what the sacred text said, the power and essence of the god is an unknowable force. Deciding that it wasn't worth looking further into with her, I asked the GM if I could make an occult roll. I had a skill of about 60% with that, and I was hoping to see if I could know anything else about our Eldritch foes. Through sheer luck, I managed to roll a critical success on this, and the GM told me that I basically knew everything about the Eldritch gods. He also sent me all the information that he had on the Outer Gods and Great Old Ones within the HP Lovecraft Mythos. While everyone else was planning how we were going to set our operation into motion, I was reading thoroughly through the information that GM sent me. I had the inklings of an idea, but I wanted to know if it could possibly work. Early the next morning b began rather thrilling. That's, that's not even a fucking... What's this? This is a nothing sentence. What is this? Oh, Jesus. Turns out that the U.S. military had found us in our little hiding place, likely getting tipped off by that fucking cult. Black Hawk and Apache attack helicopters swarmed around us, and Spec Ops troops repelled out of their helicopters. We had planned on this happening, though, and set off dozens upon dozens of smoke grenades. When the troopers win in any ways, we set off all of our homemade explosives around us, killing, injuring, incapacitating, or confusing our enemies. Meanwhile, we wasted no time gathering everything that we would need and storing it in our cars. Not long before the smoke would clear, we gunned the engines and started driving right down the side of the mountain. I have no idea how we passed our drive automobile checks on that, but by some miracle we did. Herr Schnitzel Nazi thanked the Fuhrer when he and his compatriots reached the designated area, a few miles away. The Apache helicopters hot on our tails. Fortunately, the dense foliage gave us cover. Thus, when we enacted stage three of our master escape plan. We jammed the accelerators by sticking knives through them and wired gas explosives to the airbags. After crashing them into trees and having them blow up, the military would think that we crashed. Just to buy ourselves a little more time before we did this, we had corpses from the cultists, one for each of us, put inside the cars as body doubles. Herr Schnitzel Nazi also used his vast medicinal knowledge to confuse the morticians into thinking that they would have died in the crash. After we did all of this, we fled on foot. Thankfully, my GM didn't know that most attack helicopters have heat, ultraviolet, and motion sensors on them. I was just thinking that, like, they could track you via thermals. <laughs> Stairs and hungry Apache chain gun. <laughs> like, you wouldn't make it far at all, brother. <laughs> we managed to make our way back to the old summer camp, with the military distracted by our cars. We set up a stronghold inside the lodging area for the camp counselors, and were prepared to retreat into the caverns underneath the bathroom if we had to. After a short breather, we decided that our only hope was to act quickly on the cult. 
We made some slight modifications to the plan to suit our new circumstances, but were sure that it would work. It was also around this time when I had actually found the tiny pieces of information that I needed in order for my secret plan to work. I smiled when I read this, and I swear that tear of joy actually rolled down my cheek. That night, before our operation, I sat everyone around for one final supper. I asked each of them to take of my weed, and we each smoke a last joint together. After finishing up the last of that dank ass kush, I told everyone that there would be no more lucky rolls, no more sly moves from me, and no more tricks up my sleeves. Herr Schnitzel Nazi was going to die tonight. They all told me that it wouldn't happen, and that I'd make it through this, but I silenced them so I could finish my Jesus and <laughs> my Jesus analogy. <laughs> Allegorical Jesus Nazi. It's a thing now. I told them that it was unavoidable. Herr Schnitzel Nazi had lived for 92 years. He was an old man and was ready for it all to end. But in the end, he would die saving the world. He was happy. Happy to die with a true purpose once again. But most of all, he was happy to die among not just his brothers and sisters in arms, but the only family that he can remember himself ever having. Herr Schnitzel Nazi led the charge down into the caverns beneath the camp. We were all in full battle gear, wearing full riot gear, military grade bulletproof vests, and carrying the best weapons that we could have in the game. Except me. I still insisted on my Nazi era weapons. All things we had stolen. We walked down the caverns, gleaming like knights of old ready for battle. Even the scientist and Jade the cultist, spurred on by the righteousness of our cause, decided to fight with us. Although I think Jade was also influenced by Tiffany. Tiffany's fine ass. Our plan was simple. Murder any of the nasties we find in our way, and get that nuclear warhead to that cistern in the center of the lake. Then, we'd hopefully escape to a safe distance and detonate the bomb. But we were all ready to detonate it immediately after setting it up if it meant stopping the cult. The first things that we came across were a horde of Shogoth, which blocked our pathway ahead. They came swiftly for us and we opened fire with our assault rifles. That seemed to slow their advance, but then again it wasn't really meant to kill them. Only to buy time for Tiffany to get out a grenade launcher and load incendiary grenades in it. Within a few seconds, all that was left in the pathway were us and the smell of burning Shogoth. We continued our advance, killing wave after wave of cultists, zombies, brethren, and other elderic horrors which crossed our path. We could keep slaughtering them, but slowly the battles were taking a toll on our sanity and health. Eventually, we managed to reach the cistern in the middle of the lake, most of us with only half our health and sanity left. The cistern was oddly quiet. There seemed to be nothing around us. It was clearly an ambush, but we couldn't waste time on sitting on our asses. Our group made its way to the center of the room, right by where the Shogoth was in our little tentacle porn incident, if you recall. The nuclear scientist got to work arming the bomb and detonator immediately. Ugh. When he got started on this, coming out of each of the entrances surrounding the cistern came a big brother. You remember those things, like the bastard which came out of the lake in our first session and forced us to turn Chuck the Chunk into a suicide bomber. We managed to avoid their mental attacks and began to fire upon them, as well as use up large proportions of our grenades, both of those thrown and fired out of the grenade launcher. It was when we killed about half of them that we began to feel as though we could actually win this fight. That is until dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds, of zombies, brethren, and cultists began to pour out of all the other entrances into the cistern. We fought for our lives, but were quickly losing ground. Half of us were already dead by the time our scientist buddy, who I refuse to this day to know the name of, had finished setting up the bomb and detonator. He turned to face me and handed it right to me. Don't worry, Herr Schnitzel Nazi. We'll take them all out with us, and our deaths will be quicker than the blink of an eye, he says to me. Herr Schnitzel Nazi knew of sacrifice, better than most in fact. He understood what he had to do, but it was hard for him. 
They were family to him. Yeah, yeah, Herr Schnitzel Nazi might have been a crazy former Nazi who can't even remember his days before he met Adolf, but his crusade to destroy the cult and those who fought along with him and were prepared to risk everything with him had given him purpose once again. They were the only people left alive who cared about him. And he cared about them, as well as everyone else, apart from the commies and Scientologists, but that's not important. That's what made what I was going to do next all the harder. Herr Schnitzel Nazi pulled out his Luger and executed the nuclear scientists right before him. He then proceeded to gun down all of his remaining friends, one by one. In real life, all of the others in the party turned to me with expressions of what the fuck dude and why did you do that on their faces. Without even acknowledging them, I turned to the GM. Herr Schnitzel Nazi invokes the power of the outer gods. I call upon them to unveil the essences of the great old ones before me. The GM looked through his notes, clearly not expecting what had just happened. I told him that in order for one to perform the ritual that I just did, they would have to sacrifice those left alive who were closest to them. I had done just that, and I wanted to travel to a very specific part of reality. Everyone looked confused, and that's when I threw out the information that was part of my master plan. You see, all of the greater old ones, the outer gods, don't exactly keep all of their power within them. It's extremely hard to explain. I mean, it's so hard that even the book I was reading barely goes into it. But what it basically means is that what gives the great old ones their power, all of that is tied to one very distinct place within time and space. A place that can only be accessed through an exceptionally dark and evil ritual. A ritual that I had just performed. A ritual that was taking me and my nuclear weapon right there. Killing this single great old one wasn't enough. If I were to do this, it would make every single great old one and outer god about as harmless as a crippled mouse because they literally had no more power to draw upon. The GM told me that there is a blinding flash of light before everything around me goes dark. That's when I wake up in an area so indescribably beautiful that I can hardly conceive of it. The GM told me that the only possible way that he could describe it would be that it looked like I was in the middle of a nebula. Google it if you don't know what it looks like, it's really quite beautiful. I can see my nuclear warhead right next to me, and the detonator the scientist gave me was in my hand. I was ready to push it, but before I could, the GM still had one ace up his sleeve. This was an ace that I didn't even see coming. I know that I've mentioned it earlier, but I really have to again. My GM is truly a fantastic one. He has an incredible grasp on good storytelling and how to create excitement and intrigue, as well as exceptionally complex plots. But his real strength comes from his understanding of characterization. He knows characters both in games and out. He knows me, and he knows that I'm a slave to role-playing, and he knew Herr Schnitzel Nazi's one weakness, one that even I didn't fully understand myself. The GM tells me that the voice of the god in the lake speaks to me directly, and in doing so it takes something from me. It calls upon its power to do something to me that would destroy my character without even touching him. The GM took away Herr Schnitzel Nazi's insanity. Now, I'm sure you've never heard of an Eldric god curing insanity within a game of Call of Cthulhu, but then again, this game that we played was rather original. Everything you thought you knew was a lie, the voice of the god in the lake said to me. You are nothing. Even the reality that you thought you had a grasp on was an enormous falsehood. According to the GM, everything about me that I once knew and had forgotten or suppressed was flooding back to me so fast that my mind could barely contain it. I remembered everything. My real name. The fact that I only pretended to believe in Nazi ideology. Who the Nazis hated. What I did before the war. The fact that I was actually an American. And moreover, the fact that I'm actually black. 
The GM's plan right there was actually just to make me sane once again, and rule that the flooding of memories and the complete shattering of everything that I thought I knew and believed in would destroy my mind completely, and thus leave me incapable of detonating the nuclear weapon. And I'd be left to drift aimlessly through the eternal nothingness of this plane, with my mind completely and utterly destroyed. Not the best ending to a story. Now, I won't get into the actual roles and total success I had encountering this, because frankly, the end story explanation is way more interesting and dramatic. According to the GM, I grasped onto my friends. Those that I had to kill in order to come here. If I failed them, then they'd have died for nothing. Herr Schnitzel Nazi was able to grasp on something he knew that was real. His friends and his care for them was real, not just part of his insanity. He smiled and wiped the tears from his eyes, as he knew that he'd soon be with them. Herr Schnitzel Nazi didn't care that everything he knew was a lie, and he didn't care that nothing would really matter in the end. Because for the briefest time that he spent with his friends, after the fire and blood incident, he found purpose again, and he found care for them. Even if they had to die, he knew that the feelings he had for them were all completely real. And that was it. I had won, and I hadn't even pulled the trigger on the detonator yet. The GM was out of tricks, and Herr Schnitzel Nazi had bested him. I could hear the thoughts and pleas of all the gods and great old ones. I could hear their pleas, practically begging me not to do this to them. Herr Schnitzel Nazi pulled out a blunt from his SS coat pocket and lit it up. He took a long drag, getting it down about halfway. After blowing it out, he spoke, still insisting on using his German accent. I got something to say to you guys, he asked all of the Eldritch Gods. You call us worms and pathetic, and you think us so small. Eh, to be fair, we totally are. You're just so great, and could squash us like bugs without a second thought. But when me and my friends were faced with our ends, we didn't even blink. But all you bitches did. The gods were silent as Herr Schnitzel Nazi finished up the last weed he would ever smoke again. I had to sacrifice a lot to get this far. And even then, you took something away from me. Now I'm going to take something away from you. With only a second's hesitation, I pulled the trigger on the detonator, and it succeeded in going off. The GM didn't even bother making us roll for it. According to him, the bomb goes off and annihilates the plane and everything within it. All of the gods and the old great ones are rendered completely powerless and are incapable of doing anything apart from just existing. Killing one god who fucked me over wasn't enough. I didn't want to just kill the gods in the lake. I wanted to make him suffer. Make him just sit and watch helpless to the world around him, incapable of anything. A fate like that just seemed oh so much more satisfying to me. The fact that it would also destroy every other fucking god and whatever only made it just so much sweeter. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a tale of Herr Schnitzel Nazi, the man who killed the gods. And that is... The final story to the tale of Herr Schnitzel Nazi. I hope you all enjoyed. If you like the story and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Neckbeardia. But if you like even more original stories, stop on by Guardbeardia, where I'm writing up two original stories. And like a farmer's garden is from my hands to your ears, no middleman required. So stop on by and give a listen. But until I see you next time on this side of the veil... This has been Guard Bro.